Happy New Year! Got you there, didn't I? This is New Year's, actually. It is the New Year in the church calendar. This is the first Sunday of Advent, and it is the time that the the beginning of the, the annual cycle in the life of the church, if you will, that starts with preparing for the birth of Christ, and, and more importantly, the celebration of that birth and the preparation for the return of the king when Christ comes back. And that's what the Advent season is. And so for the next four weeks, uh, we'll be dealing with Advent as we prepare our hearts and our lives for celebrating the birth of the Christ child and for building into the anticipation of the day when Christ returns and all that is messed up in this world is set right. And those are certainly things to be celebrating and looking forward to. Now, I love this time of year as New Year's for me because it's exciting. We come out of Thanksgiving and that Thanksgiving gathering, that national day of gratitude to an eternal being who is greater than ourselves. And we set aside that Thursday every year to enter into a moment of thanksgiving to the God who has blessed us beyond measure. And from there, we roll right into the Advent season. And that's why it's exciting for me. It's very easy to get excited about uh, New Year's when it takes place right now with all of the expected greatness that lays out ahead. Now, our calendar traditional New Year's, on the other hand, of January 1st, to me is one uh, that is very bleak and depressing. It's 31 days of cold, followed by 28 more days of cold, followed by 31 days of freezing rain and snow, followed by April snow showers, followed by the Mother's Day snow blizzard. So, not so much to wonderful to look for. See, it's easy to look forward to things expectantly uh, and to be hopeful for things when our prospects are good, when good things are coming down the pike and we can see them and they're almost here and we can touch them. And it's easy to get excited about what that future holds. It's much more difficult to get excited about what tomorrow holds when that future looks bleak and when we don't really understand or see or know what's coming around the bend. And we get caught up in that sometimes. And so today's message, a message about hope, and more importantly or more particularly, a living hope, is one that I hope will bring you uh, some inspiration, if you will. So uh, this is the first Sunday of Advent, as we have mentioned, and uh, people wonder, well, what does that mean? What is Advent? Well, that comes from the Latin term Adventus, and it just means arrival or coming or approaching. So what's coming? What's arriving? Is Aunt Martha coming? I don't know. Are there packages and presents and cards that are coming? Sure, there are. But what's coming in the Christian realm is our Lord and Savior. And we are going to celebrate the birth of the Messiah. And we are going to eagerly anticipate the return of the King and prepare ourselves for that. And because Advent is the beginning of the the church calendar and year, if you will, uh, during Advent, we traditionally follow the four themes of the Advent wreath or the uh, candles of the Advent. And so we'll be looking at those in a a sermon series that that I'm I'm calling The Practice of the Presence of God. And I actually got this title from a personal devotion that I'm engaged in right now. It's a 40-day devotion entitled The Practice of the Presence of God. And it's uh, based on the writings of a monk from the 17th century, Brother Lawrence, who over a period of years in his service to the monastery sent a bunch of letters to a friend of his who just kind of collected those letters and later on put them down in writing. And it was just Brother Lawrence's ideas about how he practiced the presence of God. 
And it's really interesting because sometimes you think, well, yeah, what, what's a monk got to do? You know, he's just in a monastery all day and, they, you know, they got vespers and they've got this prayer meeting and that, the bell rings and they go and pray and that's all he does all day. But it's a whole lot deeper and a whole lot richer and it actually is something that's applicable in our personal lives. You can practice the presence of the risen Lord in your life right here and right now. Tomorrow, Thursday. It doesn't matter when or where you're at. You can walk with God because of the hope that he has instilled in everyone by becoming Emmanuel. And we'll touch on that a little bit more in, in, in a little bit. But the Isaiah passage 9-2, one that's familiar for this Sunday of the year, every year. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. The promise is that wherever you're at right now, am I yelling at you? I'm sorry. I just get excited sometimes, and it comes out, okay? So uh, if, if we need to, we can back the mic down a little bit, but I cannot contain my enthusiasm because the living God wants to meet with you in the here and now. And the presence of that can be practiced daily. And so... The people who live in darkness. Have you ever been in darkness? Have you found yourself in a dark moment recently? We all have. It's been dark. It's been bleak. There's been no prospect of a future. But the people in darkness have seen a great light. Scripture passage today is going to come from 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading verses 3 through 9. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You love him, though you have not seen him, and though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hope is the word that we, we latch on to today. It is the, the first candle of the Advent reach, wreath in which we, we light a light. And as we move through services from now through Christmas, and there are many of them, and you are welcome to attend any, all, or as few as you choose. Uh, there is no condemnation in that. Whatever fits your schedule, please join us. But throughout that time, we will be lighting lights. We'll be lighting candles. The light will get brighter and brighter and stronger as it grows into that season and the culmination of the celebration of the birth of the Christ child when full light is brought into view and so this is what we're looking at. Hope is that first light that is lit. The first glimmer, the first thing that gives us a promise for a prospect of tomorrow that is beyond what we can imagine. So what is hope? Well, hope has to be more than a word that is synonymous with uh, something that you wish for or want or are desiring. Hope is a little bit bigger than that. I use an acronym for, for hope. Hang on, providence exists. Well, what do I mean by that? Hang on. Endure. Persevere. Stay the course. You're not doomed yet. Just hold on one second longer. Success is usually veiled beyond just that last second of perseverance. And if you can hang on, you can get there. Well, hang on to what? Providence with a capital P, that's God. That's a, that is a God who is active and engaged in his creation. That's the God I believe in, a God who is alive, who is, is providential, whose hand is on the happenings of the world, and he exists, and he's real, and he's there for you. Now, in the New Testament, uh, the Greek word that is translated as hope many times is the word 
El Pis. And El Pis, this word has a, a little bit different connotation than the word hope that we, we kind of use in, in our vernacular today. But the word El Pis actually comes from the Greek mythology of Pandora. Now, Pandora's story, if you don't know it, she was the first woman created by the gods and given to man. And along with her, she, was, she had an earthen jar with a lid on it. And in it were all the, the woes and passions and sorrows of man. And, and she opened this jar and unleashed it all on men. And there was one thing in the jar that did not get out, whether it was hung up under the lid of the jar or, or whatever ancient writings have different uh, theories beyond that. But, but in the Greek mythology, El Pis is the one thing, hope, that didn't escape the jar. Now, this hope, El Pis, that didn't get out, first of all, was um, a little bit, like I said, different than, than the hope word we use today. Because it was an anticipation or an expectation of either good or bad. It was hope for good or a foreboding of something bad that would happen. It's two sides of the same coin, basically. Now, in our earthen jars, the vessels that we have, hope has not escaped. It is trapped in there, but it is two sides of the same coin. It is either an expectation of good, or it is a foreboding of evil. And which side of the coin that comes up in your life often depends on how you look at things on what in life you are anchored to. You understand what I'm saying here? Your hope hinges on what you're trusting in. Your hope will come up heads or tails depending on who or whom you have put your faith in. The psalmist writes that God is our refuge in Psalm 46 and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble in its tumult. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. He's not absent, he's present. He is a God who is there should we choose to call on him. He is a God who cares. He's in the room. He's with you today, he's with you on Thursday. He is available at any time. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. And it doesn't matter what happens in the earth. It doesn't matter if it changes do we see change? All the time. The only thing constant in change or in life is change. The only thing you can be guaranteed of is that tomorrow will look different than today. And there is a present God available that you can practice being in the presence of continually. And when that is where you're anchored, hope comes up aces every time. Because my future is trusted to a God who cares. And the culmination of this hope that we're talking about in God's deliverance from the perils of the world is found in the coming Messiah. The Messiah who is the anointed one of the line of David who will take away the sins of the world. He was to come and deliver Israel from all of their woes. He was to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when we understand that God is with us, we can truly say who or what can be against us. Because victory is ours when we believe that the God who is with us is actually with us right now, right here, right beside you. See, the world tells us to put our hope and our trust in many other things. 
tells us to put our trust in government. The government will be your savior. I believe in Ronald Reagan's statement that the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. The world tells us to put our trust in science and data. But they have no understanding of what science even is anymore. Science is a word that literally means to know. To be in the know. To know for certain. This is a fact. In a world where we choose other things over that, it gets a little confusing. But science doesn't mean to guess. Science, the word science, doesn't mean to speculate or postulate or pontificate on things. Science means to know. To know for certain by either observation or replication. What do I mean by replication? It means I can produce it under an experiment in a lab. I can, I can say if I do this, this, and this, this happens every time. That's science. That's to know. If it is we think and it may and some people and it could, that's not science. That's guessing. And so the world tells us, put our trust in science, and most science is all guesswork these days. The world tells us, put our trust in the economy or in our pocketbooks or in the bank. And if you were paying attention this last Friday, Black Friday turned into Bleak Friday as the Dow dropped 900 points and the S&P dropped 500. We're told to put our trust in technology and education without getting all off into how those things have led us into the weeds, into personal achievements and into humanity itself. The Bible is very clear and warns us very harshly about putting our trust in the false hopes of idols and of this world. In Psalm 146, 3, it says, Do not trust in princes, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. If you're hanging your hat on some person to rescue you, the Bible's clear, not going to happen. No salvation in that animal. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. I don't need to break that one down for you at all. I think, I think it speaks very clearly. That's Jeremiah 17, 5. If you doubt me, write it down and go look it up. That's what it says. Psalms 121, 1 and 2 says, I look to the hills. Where does my strength come from? David was a warrior king. The hills were where fortifications were built. This is how you controlled the land. You built the fort on the high ground, and you had command of the low ground. And David says, I look to the hills, but where does my strength come from? Not from the hills. It comes from God. God is where my hope is set. God is what I have put my trust in. Not the fortifications of man, not the governments of man, not anything this world has to offer, but God himself. So how do I know if I'm trusting in a false God? How do I know if I've got my faults or if I've got my hope misplaced? Well, first of all, you know that you're trusting in a false hope if it promises to solve all your problems. If it came in a pill, everybody would have it. If it was easy, everybody would be there. If your hope, the thing that you're trusting in, tells you that if you just do this, everything's going to be okay, it's a false hope. Because God does not promise to solve all of your problems. God does not promise to smooth out every road you will walk on. God does not promise that if you follow me from this day forward, you will have no problems at all. He doesn't promise us we'll never suffer again. In fact, Jesus said, in this life, you will have troubles. You will have tribulations. You will have trials, depending on which translation you look at. They all pretty much mean the same thing. In this life, it's going to stink. Bad things are going to happen to you. They're coming down the pike. You can't dodge it. You can't avoid it. You can't make it go away. Now I'm yelling and spitting. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, great if you're in the front row and Elvis was, it was Elvis talking to you. Y'all be all like, whoo. But... <laughs> sorry I get a little wrapped up here sometimes but Jesus said you will have trouble but be not dismayed be not overwhelmed be not overcome when he says be not he means don't do that don't get discouraged you're gonna have trouble but don't be dismayed 
I have overcome the world. And that's the promise, that's the hope that we have. Even Jesus faced bad times. He was tempted, he was tried, he was put on trial, he was crucified, he was dead and buried, and then he rose again and overcame every issue that you would have in this life. And so when bad times come your way, we trust in a present God in and through that blood atonement of Christ which puts us in standing where we need not dread what tomorrow holds. Our future is secure. God doesn't promise an easy life, but he promises an eternal one. And he is there to carry you from this moment into the next, into the next, and into eternity of glory, of a time when there is no suffering, when you will once, for once and forever be promised that all of that stuff is put away. Secondly, you know that you're putting your trust in a false hope if your hope doesn't rely on God itself. The psalmist writes, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Scripture tells us. If God is not part of the equation, you're trusting a false hope. And so the question is, who are you looking to to ultimately deliver you? Where is your security set? Is it in technology? Is it in achievements, personal or family? Is it in government? Is it in the wisdom of your neighbor? Where have you hung your hat? Where is your trust? Without God as part of the equation, all of these things will ultimately fail you. And thirdly, it's a false hope if it does not involve relationship. And that's what we're talking about this week and for the weeks to come. Practicing the presence of God. Being in a relationship with the one who has called you to himself. See, he calls us into a continual, a perpetual relationship with him. He doesn't want to just hear from you on Sunday morning, which is good. He does like to hear from you then. But what about Tuesday afternoon? What about Friday night? He wants to be with you in all of those moments. He wants to be a real and present help when that next trouble comes along. Our greatest hopes and our greatest desires show us this need for relationship. All true hope comes from our feeling the need of relationship with God. Without it, we're lost. Without it, things are meaningless. Peter, in this first epistle that we read today, he's said that Jesus Christ has given us a living hope. Not a dead hope, not a false hope, but a living hope. This is what God offers to us, an opportunity to be in his presence today and all days. And that's what this first candle represents, the light of Christ, the living hope that God has poured out for us, that he has called us into. That hope began as a child in the manger, vulnerable, helpless little baby conceived by the Holy Spirit, born unto Mary and Joseph. And this is where hope began. And from that moment, it began to grow and to flourish and to become something new and radiant and big. The small child grew because unlike the 61 million plus aborted babies that have taken place since Roe versus Wade, and I'll walk off on a little bit of a tangent trail with that, this unplanned and unanticipated child was given the opportunity to become the living hope of humanity. I would encourage you to be in prayer this Wednesday uh, starting at uh, 10 a.m. The uh, Supreme Court of the United States begins hearing oral arguments on a case called Dobbs versus Jackson 
Jackson Women's Help Organization. This is a case out of Mississippi, and uh, it will be determining whether Mississippi has the uh, authority uh, under its state legislature to ban elective abortions for uh, 15 week gestation and beyond pregnancies. And some of the questions is that, that will be placed before the justices in this will be con uh, considering things that will strike down right at the core of Roe versus Wade. And so when that, as that deliberation begins, and there won't be a decision until uh, midsummer probably, but as that begins, I would encourage you to be in prayer over that. Because life matters. Humanity has been given a hope and a future because of a young child who was born out of wedlock to a young teenage lady so many years ago. And he grew. He grew in his stature and wisdom, and with that hope grew. He amazed others with his teachings, and that hope grew. He performed miracles and signs of, of wonders, and hope grew some more. He gathered the broken and the lost and the children to him. And hope continued to grow. He suffered and sacrificed himself on a cross and was put to death. And hope grew. On the third day, he was raised from the dead, appeared before his disciples and ascended to the right hand of God the Father. And hope grew eternal. One day he will come again and bring God's kingdom to earth and all that is wrong will be made right this is the living hope this is what we are anchored to this is the foundation the bedrock that we build our lives on and i encourage you to put your hope in the living hope of the christ who overcame death don't put your faith in the dying hopes and the failing hopes and the false hopes of this world they are shadows that will only disappoint you. There's an old hymn that we used to sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. There's three more verses to that hymn. When darkness veils his lovely face, when I rest in his unchanging grace, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found faultless to stand before the throne. Let us come to the living hope of Christ that we may stand secure in every moment of our life knowing that there is a real and present God who walks with us in the midst of our troubles. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you again today. <laughs> We are excited and filled with the joy that your hope gives to us. Lord, I pray that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here today, that you light in each of us a fire of an understanding that our tomorrows are secure because you reign eternally. Lord, bless us as we leave from this place today and infuse in us an understanding of your hope that we may be, bring to others an understanding of the hope of humanity and that it hangs solely on you and your grace. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.